All right, this is uh, video number two for Napoleon. I want to kind of focus on what's the man's long-term impact. And when we look at the, um, the longevity of the French Empire and Napoleon's career, it's, it's really quite short. Um, and Napoleon is, is, is one of the most important guys of the early 19th century. And so our, our, what we really left with is, is just this, this brief 15, 16 year period between when he seizes power and when he's finally defeated uh, the second time at Waterloo and has to go into exile the second time and spends the rest of his life down on St. Helena. Um, is, that, is that really all there is? Why is he so important if that's all there is? Well, there is a lot more to it. He had a, a long influence well beyond uh, the years when the French Empire dominated Europe, which was only until 1815, and well beyond his own lifetime. So let's take a look. First of all, I want to start with his military influence. And, you know, the phrase is always strategy and tactics. I'm going to start with tactics, though, uh, and then do strategy. And, uh, you know, his military influence has, has been obvious for uh, a couple of generations. Uh, the generals who thought they were great, they all wanted to be Napoleon uh, or try to be Napoleon. And what we see is that for a couple of generations, and really up until the middle of the century, 1860s, uh, the, the way that the, the generals actually put their troops into combat, that's, that's what tactics are, what you do with your troops and your equipment on the actual battlefield, they were copying the things that Napoleon did and the, uh, the kind of battlefield techniques that he developed. And even in the American Civil War, we see them fighting the same way that Napoleon had. Massed formations, everybody shoulder to shoulder, bayonets gleaming, march forward, cannons pushed forward. But by the 1860s, when you fight the American Civil War and some of the, uh, the wars that are going on in Europe, like the uh, Italian Wars of Unification, you, you, get, uh, you can get disastrous casualties. In the American Civil War, uh, the, the rifled musket is a much, much better weapon than what Napoleon's troops were using, and the casualties are disastrous. So for a few decades, people, people copied the way Napoleon fought on the battlefield. And as a result, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, men lost until they start to change their tactics in response to uh, improving technology. Now, in terms of strategy, and strategy is not the same as tactics. Strategy is, is uh, how you are... Um, moving on, on the whole map in terms of reaching your objective. And what, what is your objective? In older warfare, in the 18th century, um, the objective uh, was often to see if you could maneuver the other guy into a bad position and then uh, maybe force him to retreat without really even having to fight a battle. Uh, when they did fight wars, Rarely are they actually trying to destroy the other kingdom. Uh, that's just that's just not the objective. The objectives are much more limited. Well, Napoleon is, is not usually trying to destroy the other kingdom, but he's definitely trying to destroy the other army. It's not going to be meet on the battlefield, and now we'll kind of have an army versus army duel. He went at it as, now that we're at war, I am going to try to completely annihilate your army unless it surrenders. And so he was always trying to envelop, to reach around, to get behind the enemy. He wanted to put his army between them and their supplies, between them and their uh, communications back toward headquarters or toward their capital, he's always trying to place himself and maneuver so that he's going to force you to fight. He's going to come at you from more than one direction. And this sort of war of movement is something that 
the generals of, uh, that uh, are after Napoleon all seek to emulate. And it's kind of interesting. We see it again a little bit when we get to the Franco-Prussian War. The Prussians are able to uh, envelop, cut off, and destroy French armies. They're forced to surrender because they're, they're cut off, they're running out of supplies, and they're, they're just stuck. And then we hit World War I, and although the generals wanted to have that happen, once again the technology has changed, and they find nobody's moving. They get stuck in trenches, pinned down by machine guns, and hammered by heavy artillery. And so World War I looks nothing like the Napoleonic Wars. But then again, technology again moves forward, and when we get to World War II, the tank has advanced to the point that it's able to break through these static lines, and we see war of movement once again. And so World War II, um, with units spread all over and moving all over the map, we see once again looks a lot like the Napoleonic era. So he definitely had a lot of, uh, of influence in terms of strategy. Still today in war, they look to get between the enemy and his communications, to cut off communications, to cut off supply, and force that enemy to surrender or be destroyed. Um, Napoleon was a logistics guy. That's, that's, uh, that's your supplies. He understood how armies lived. Now, I already explained that he could, uh, he could live off the land, and that was something that the revolutionary armies did, and he continues that practice. He's not going to tie his army to a baggage train uh, and, and to the chuck wagons so that the army is slow. But at the same time, you don't forage for ammunition and, and weapons. Uh, you have to deliver those things. You have to keep the men paid. You have to keep the men fed. You have to keep the men supplied with weapons and ammunition and boots and uniforms. And he understands that. Logistics is something he cares about, and he makes sure it happens. And logistics is now a, uh, a major part in any army uh, or any military endeavor. The, the commanders must care about logistics, and they have a logistics staff. Um, legal influence. This is something that people forget about Napoleon. He was the ruler of France, and so he, he puts himself to the task of reforming certain things. And one of the, I think the most important thing he did, and I, I put two here, the Napoleonic Code. He basically attacks the chaotic state of French law. And French law has all kinds of local variation. We have lots of judges that basically think, I can, I can write law myself. I'll just say, I, well, this says this, but I think it should mean this. And he says, no, no, no. We're going to have the same law. For France and if you're a judge you're going to judge what the law says not make it up as you go along you're not going to judge based on what you think it should say and so this this Napoleonic code still is used you know it's been modified but it's still used in France not only that but France becomes a major colonizing nation later in the 1800s and so the French colonies also get the Napoleonic Code, and today something like 25% of countries around the world use some variant variation of the Napoleonic Code. That's pretty impressive. The Concordat, the uh, Republican government, the Jacobins, uh, had uh, really declared war on Christianity, and even before that, the, uh, the National Assembly had... Uh, tried to make the Catholic clergy take an oath to the French state, and uh, they have really broken the relationship between France and the Catholic Church. And uh, Napoleon understands that this was not a popular thing in France, although many of the intellectuals are kind of leaning in atheistic directions, the vast majority of the population remains uh, religious, they remain Catholic, and they they didn't they didn't get into this revolution to remove Christ from their culture, and so uh, this is something that's uh, basically undoing the unpopular things that had happened earlier in the revolution. At the same time, he's going to respect the Enlightenment ideal of 
you know, the, the, the church needs to stick with things of the faith and the state is the state. Or as Jefferson put it, a wall of separation between church and state. And so basically the formula that he comes up with is that most French citizens are Catholic. The French church, the Catholic church in France is permitted to function freely, but they're not going to have any official role in the government. It's not going to be a state religion. They're not going to control education, but they are going to be able to operate freely and operate as any other organization under the law. That's an important step, and more or less, France still operates under that kind of model. Finally, most freewheeling section of all the geopolitical influence, um, we've already talked about one of the major uh, issues um, or isms or whatever that, that comes out of the French Revolution is the development of nationalism. And we see it directly in France, but also uh, French military action and Napoleon's invasions of various places um, are going to provoke nationalism in the places where he went, notably Spain, but lots of other places too, uh, where the people basically want to rise up against French control. So we see nationalism is a major impact of Napoleon's campaigns and the French Empire. Republicanism, you know, uh, Napoleon rules as, uh, I know he technically is an emperor uh, after 1804, but honestly, he's a popular emperor. He, his, his position is approved by the people. I think it's more realistic to view him as a popular military dictator. And as a popular military dictator, he retains some Republican forms. Uh, he doesn't do away with the ideas of, of, of uh, Republicanism in the sense of the people's representatives are who governs. And he himself basically is the number one representative of the French people. So where he goes, he establishes Republican governments or semi-Republican governments. Some of them are kind of constitutional monarchies, but this is, this is what Napoleon does. And so these ideas are gonna sink roots in other places, not just France. The coming of French armies is spreading nationalism and spreading republicanism. And even after the Congress of Vienna, when uh, monarchies are put back in place and we're gonna try to undo everything that the French Revolution did, even after that, these dreams don't die. The seeds are planted and they will grow again, notably in, in 1848, the spring of nations. Balance of power. French power badly disrupted the balance of power. And maybe this partly explains why the British are such inveterate enemies of Napoleon. Of all the nations of Europe, Britain is the one most obsessed with this idea of balance of power. And they just will not make peace with Napoleon. And what is one of the main principles of the Congress of Vienna when the peace is made? We must have a balance of power, which includes even restoring France. France is a major country. They just couldn't imagine a balanced Europe without France. So there's not going to be a let's partition France. There's not going to be a let's, let's turn France into a giant pasture. France is allowed to basically resume its place, not as a as the dominant nation, but as one of the great powers of Europe. So this is a this is an important um, this is an important principle that emerges out of uh, out of the Congress of Vienna, out of Napoleon's era, and uh, this will this will generate a, a a general peace that will last the better part of a century, and punctuated with a few limited wars. But nothing like uh, nothing like the Napoleonic Wars until World War One. Uh, Germany, the first steps toward creating a united Germany, start with Napoleon. Napoleon's actions basically wreck the uh, the shell of the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire. And when uh, when Napoleon is gone, uh, his his confederation of the Rhine, his allies of, of small German states. Uh, that's going to be wiped away, but it's going to be replaced with the German Confederation, uh, which will include the two dominant states, Prussia and Austria. But gradually, Prussia will start to 
uh, to make moves to unite the smaller states of the German Confederation under their leadership. And uh, we're going to see a customs union be put in place that's going to allow Germany to start uniting economically. But little by little, Germany is going to come together until the Franco-Prussian War, and then Germany will be united in 1871. The first steps started by Napoleon. Russia. Russia is indisputably a great power. They've been in, they've been out. Uh, they've had a lot of respect. They've had less respect. But Russia's handling of Napoleon in 1812 and their participation in the alliance, which finally puts him down and sends him packing, makes Russia a great power. It is not disputable. And Russia now has interests in Central Europe and in the Balkans, which are going to have to be considered. This is going to start to uh, shape how the uh, 19th century is going to go. Finally, the British Empire. Napoleon did not create the British Empire by any means, but it sure got a major boost from fighting against Napoleon. Um, a little bit before the French Revolution, the, uh, the British Empire took a, a hit. They lost the American colonies. And so when we start our revolutionary period, they have India, they have Canada, they have some, uh, they have some possessions in the Caribbean. They're going to they're gonna gain by uh, grabbing the Cape Colony down uh, South Africa. Um, they're going to, um, they actually got that seven years war, my fault. But they're going to really solidify their hold. And not only that, but think about what's happening in Britain at this time. They're in the early stages of industrial development, which means while Europe's busy with Napoleon, they're safe on their island. And they're going to get a head start in industrialization. And it's just going to amplify the fact that with their, with their empire, they're already dominant at sea. And they're already dominant commercially. And they're already the wealthiest. They're going to turn that wealth and the budding industrial strength into real power around the globe. And it's just going to give them a head start in industrialization. They're going to get uh, a head start in colonization. The second wave, new imperialism, the British are going to get a big head start. Uh, and they're going to create the empire on which the sun never sets. It's really a 19th century empire. And they owe a lot of the credit to the strain of war against Napoleon. So I think these are pretty big impacts, and he remains one of our most important historical characters and certainly a standout from the early 19th century. All right, bye-bye.